Welcome to uh, uh, sessions, uh, what do you call like this line, uh, as we get ourselves ready to write the Ministry of Law Entrance Examination. Uh, very much aware, uh, these sessions are not in any particular uh, university or college. Uh, it's open to every uh, student in Ghana who is writing this uh, entrance examination. That has been the approach that we'll be using uh, since. Uh, uh, and the aim of you to pay attention to doing critical things as we learn so that you avoid certain mistakes and then your approach is also uh, properly pitched to meet uh, what is expected of you. Um, we are very have a very experienced uh, an uh, examiner from the University of Ghana who will be teaching for uh, many years and also a practitioner to share on uh, yeah, I mean, barely. 48 hours or less than that, or let me say even like uh, 28 hours examination. So indicated in the advertisement I sent, we uh, among other things on constitutional law, just to let you know that the speaker is very kind in the day, he sent me a couple of materials. Uh, I might have posted some materials to you this afternoon on, uh, on the uh, Constitutional Law Commission for Inquiry and all that. Yeah. And, and the senior who uh, tonight. So what, uh, so I'll like to, Welcome our tonight, uh, a senior in law at the University of Ghana School of Law and uh, a seasoned legal practitioner is in Dr. Abdul Aziz. And I have omitted the uh, one name at the Bamba as well. Sorry, yeah, Dr. Abdul Bamba. Yes. Now, he to spend a few minutes to give us a brief thoughts and then he would like his time towards uh, Q&A. So we have muted all consistent with our established all you want. Before I hand over to Dr. Bassett, ability to have had a speaker for the earlier session. Uh, just for him to join us. So, well, depending upon the ability tomorrow to uh, give us a slot. That is, uh, I am going that uh, we will be able to, he has to also uh, as we move towards the, the finishing line, as it will. Yeah, I've gotten a, a feedback from some of you that the, the sound, which is played when a person join or leave, is the same. So I'm trying to uh, disable that. Okay. So, but it appears. I keep trying. So, uh, Dr. Bassett, please, you're very much welcome to tonight's session. 
And let me also say that uh, because the license we have at Kwame Nkrumah University uh, has a capacity of 300. And I think that there is consistent with other universities as well. We cannot have more than uh, 300. And because of that, I am streaming this thing also live on the Facebook. So if you know anyone who wants to benefit from these sessions or even yourself, if at some point you lose your seat in the Zoom classroom, just type and it's also the part in the Facebook. And I think you go to my, uh, I think the timeline or something, you see the live streaming and then you can join us. On the other hand, if you are not able to take advantage, we will endeavor to uh, download this and put it on the YouTube and so that you can go and play it as well. So thank you very much. Dr. Abdul Basset, please, uh, you're welcome. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Ernest. Uh, it's an honor uh, and a great pleasure uh, to be with you uh, this evening. Um, <clears throat> As my very good friend, uh, Ernest uh, earlier in indicated, Ernest has been a very good friend of mine for, uh, for several years. Uh, we have decided that in order for you uh, to benefit tremendously from today's, from this evening's interaction, uh, instead of um, just uh, doing a long uh, lecture or giving a, a very long uh, remarks, what I will do uh, is that I will make very brief comments on areas that I think you should pay particular attention to. Um, I won't take more than maybe 10 minutes and then we'll open it up for q and I think a QA and a format will be much more beneficial to you at this stage uh, than uh, a lecture uh, on any particular aspects uh, of constitutional, constitutional law. So my, my brief remarks. Um, I tend to regard constitutional law as the grandmother or grandfather of all laws, uh, because all laws, in a sense, uh, take their root uh, from constitutional law. So when you take at the level of our constitution, for example, almost all and any area of law that you have studied uh, could be said to rest on Article 11, on the sources of law of Ghana. Now, now this is to to emphasize the importance of constitutional law as far as the study of law uh, is, is concerned. Constitutional law is one of the easiest of all the law courses. Uh, unfortunately, many students tend to regard constitutional law to be very difficult. Now, this misconception about the difficulty of constitutional law arises from the fact that uh, Often people do not study constitutional law in the right, the right framework. Uh, once you get the right framework for the set of constitutional law, uh, I think it is easier now to see the various aspects of constitutional law within uh, that, that framework. And when you do that, when you do it that way, I think it makes it uh, easier to appreciate constitutional law principles and also makes it easier for you to enjoy constitutional law uh, better. Now, having said that, there are certain aspects of constitutional law that you must always take particular, uh, pay particular attention to when you are going to take a constitutional law uh, as or any exam that, to, that involves constitutional law. Now, one aspect is constitutionalism. Uh, constitutionalism is such an important aspect of constitutional law that I think all of you by now should have, uh, would have spent some time looking at constitutionalism, uh, the elements of constitutionalism, the conditions in the country that give rise to constitutionalism uh, and so on uh, and, and, and so forth. Now, again, because of certain uh, current issues, certain topical issues, I would advise that you pay particular attention to chapter five on fundamental human rights uh, and freedoms. Uh, already, uh, many of my students have, uh, have been asking me questions about gay rights. The bill that has been introduced in parliament that seeks to ensure proper sexual and uh, family values, uh, whether or not uh, it's, it, whether or not it is likely that you'll be asked a question on, on gay rights, uh, their constitutionality, and the constitutionality of, of the proposed bill if it is passed uh, into law. So I, I think you should spend some time uh, looking, looking at that. Now, but because issues of gay rights 
uh, not issue, it's not an issue that has been uh, determined by uh, our Supreme Court. Uh, perhaps let me spend a bit of time uh, highlighting some of the arguments that have been used in certain jurisdictions uh, to support gay rights or against gay rights. Um, I am a bit ambivalent about, about this issue. As uh, law students, uh, you should be aware of the arguments for and, and against rights, especially when they are raised as issues of fundamental human rights. Now, the arguments for, for gay rights uh, essentially have been fourfold. Now, the first argument relates to the issue of the right to personal liberty. Uh, in our constitution, Article 14 deals with personal liberty. Now, under this uh, limb of the argument, the argument is that, look, um, I have personal liberty. I'm entitled to define for myself what is good for me, what is in my interest, uh, entitled to express what I have defined for myself as beneficial for my well-being. And if I have defined that my identity relates to a certain kind of relationship with others, right? And that expression of identity doesn't cause you any harm. I am entitled to do that. And you, in a way, opposing the expression of that identity and that conduct is against my fundamental human right to personal liberty, to personal freedom. So that is one argument. So one argument is about identity. And this context, identity is about the right that I have to define what is good for me. It is not for anybody to define what is good for me, not for a religion or for a political party or whatever to define what is good for me. I have a fundamental right to personal freedom and I define what is good for me. I decide whether I want to go to heaven or whether I want to go to hell, if I believe in that at all, right? So once I have defined that, it is not for you to tell me that what I have chosen to do is lawful or unlawful. So that's one argument. Now, the other argument relates to the issue of dignity, right? And you find that uh, in Article 15. So Article 15 says that the dignity of all persons uh, is inviolable, right? Now, this dignity argument is also related to the argument about personal, about personal liberty, right? If I have the right to express how I want to be, then you must, you must respect that expression of my identity by not making me feel as if I'm a criminal, as if I am dirty, as if I am unwealthy as a human being by prohibiting what I've chosen to express as an aspect of my identity. So the argument about, about right to identity uh, and then right to personal liberty appear to uh, go uh, uh, together. And you remember that in the Ejaan Pofu case, uh, which has to do with whether or not uh, a chief calling uh, somebody to, to come uh, before the chief uh, is constitutional or unconstitutional. That's one of the arguments that was made was an argument about identity, but our Supreme Court took the view that uh, identity as a standalone uh, principle will not be given uh, a kind of like legal expression or legal validity, right? In terms of you enforcing it. However, if you take identity uh, in light, uh, in conjunction with other uh, human rights principles, then of course you could give effect to that. So when you are making any argument relating to identity, know that it shouldn't be a standalone argument, it should go with other, other arguments. Now, the other argument that is also made uh, in support of issues of uh, gay rights and certain even gay marriage is an argument relating to equality, right? You know, uh, under our constitution, we have equality before the law, that is Article 17. Uh, whether or not uh, I, I, I have a certain sexual orientation, uh, I'm still a human being. And I'm entitled, I'm entitled to equal treatment without any discrimination. If opposite uh, sex uh, persons could do certain things, why not same sex persons? So that by, by this argument, not allowing uh, same sex persons uh, to do what they say they want to do as an expression of their identity uh, is against or violates uh, the right to equality and uh, equality uh, uh, before, before the law. Now, the other argument that is also made uh, is the right to uh, privacy, especially 
for homosexual conduct that is expressed uh, in private, right? Uh, 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 the right to privacy is covered by Article 18 of the Constitution. And there have been a number of cases, uh, two main cases uh, by the Supreme Court in respect of uh, the right to uh, privacy. So I'll, I'll, I'll ask that to you know, familiarize ourselves with the two, the two decisions. Uh, so the idea here is that, well, uh, whatever we do in the comfort of our homes, outside of the glare of people is none of your business, right? So whatever expression, expression of love, uh, that we exhibit within the confines of our homes uh, should not be the concern uh, of the law. The law should not be interested in what is it that we do uh, in private, especially if no harm has been caused to a third party. Um, so by reason of that, uh, and since uh, same self people do not do their thing in the full glare of people, uh, then on the basis of upholding the right to privacy, uh, we shouldn't uh, criminalize or criminalizing it would be against their fundamental, fundamental human rights. So these are generally the kinds of arguments that are made in support of, 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 of gay rights. Now, right to our conduct or allowing same self marriages at all uh, was, was achieved, was achieved through legislation. It wasn't achieved through judicial interpretation or judicial enforcement. Yeah, so, when you take the UK, for, it, uh, for instance, or you take Germany, Australia, and many other countries, it is the legislature that says that now public attitude about these matters has changed. And by reason of that, we are going to pass a law to decriminalize uh, uh, homosexuality, for example, or to allow civil partnership or self-marriage. Right, right. So the argument is, well, it is not the duty of the cause to get into such matter of immense, uh, um, such a matter of social policy, right? Matters of social policy should be limited to the cause, should be confined to the cause. The cause are the ones who have the mandates of the people. They are the ones who have the legal mandate, the democratic mandate to make any changes to our laws. Okay. So if uh, homosexual people and their supporters want changes in the law, they should try to convince parliamentarians and have that done. But to allow the judiciary, uh, unelected people to now impose their will on us one way or the other is on the, on the democratic is against all democratic principles. So, so this is the main argument that is used against the judiciary, for example, uh, trying to use the process of judicial interpretation uh, to allow or decriminalize uh, uh, homosexual um, uh, behavior. So, 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 so look at that. So, so for example, if uh, you have a question about the constitutionality of this bill that has been introduced in Parliament, you could you could advance arguments around the right. To privacy, around um, the right to dignity, uh, around the right to equality and uh, non-discrimination and the right to personal liberty to show that that bill, if it becomes law, uh, will be unconstitutional because it will be against uh, fundamental human rights as guaranteed by Chapter 5 of the 1992 Constitution. Now, this is, um, is the issue of, of whether there are some provisions in our Constitution uh, that, require, that require amendment because they haven't worked Work well so far, right? Um, those of you who are part of the Constitution Review Commission, we realize that you are look at the recommendations uh, regarding the uh, the judiciary. Um, as part of the recommendations in respect of the of the judiciary, uh, oh, sorry, uh, the executive uh, matters related to the executive legislature, maybe you should look at Article Seventy One uh, on. On uh, Article 71 
uh, office office holders. What the committee recommended was that instead of having various provisions in our constitution dealing with the issues of emoluments, perhaps we should repeal all those provisions and have the independent independent emoluments commission, and that would determine the emoluments of all public uh, officers, all office holders. Uh, right from the president to the lowest person in the public uh, service. So, 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 so look at uh, so look at that. I also suggest that you look at um, commissions commissions of of inquiry. We've had a number of uh, commissions that uh, yeah, also was a uh, uh, commission, uh, and recently uh, the commission that was set up uh, to look into uh, um, uh, the caca issue. Uh, you know, so. So look at um, uh, chapter 26 on commissions of inquiry and, and I sent NS an article I did on commissions of inquiry that summarizes uh, the, the long commissions of inquiry uh, with, with supporting with relevant uh, 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 cases. Um, I think these, these are the areas also citizenship. Uh, citizenship. Uh, citizenship is one issue I think you should pay particular attention to. Uh, with a number of cases in our course relating to dual citizenship involving uh, MPs, uh, I think if you spend some time familiarizing yourself with the relevant principles of citizenship uh, law, and if there are any areas that require amendment, particularly because a bill has been introduced in, in Parliament uh, trying to um, now uh, trying to uh, take away or repeal some of the restrictions that have been imposed on dual citizenships and the within section 16 of the citizenship act uh, also so spend some time uh, and look at uh, citizenship uh, uh, also so these are my my brief uh, comments i will pause here and then i will i will take any questions that you may have uh, ns Uh, is Anas with us? Uh, we... uh, Anas? Please, if you want to ask a question, tap your hand. In. Hello. Good evening, Godwin, and good evening to Dr. Bassett. Uh, Hello. Uh, good evening to one and all, and to you, especially Dr. Bassett and Dr. Osudafa. Uh, I'm very grateful, and the class is as well also grateful for the areas with access to avail our minds to. But uh, I wish to, if you could help me with what the constitution, the true meaning of the constitution has been, Article 33.5. Yeah, okay. Uh, and, and should I take uh, a number of questions uh, and then, uh, should we take a number of questions and then I answer them together or we should do uh, a question and answer? Uh, Ennis, what do you think? Yeah. So let's take four more. Okay, all right. Hello, Dr. Bassett. Oh, hello. Um, please, you mentioned um, Article 14 in relation to the LGBT argument. I want to know, because there's a... My understanding of that provision is that it's related to the restriction on movement. So I don't really get the argument yeah, in relation to LGBT. Okay, that's fine. Uh, any, any other questions? Let's take a Hello. Yeah, yeah, hello, we can hear you. Okay, thank you. Uh, please, uh, my question is in relation to writing of legal memo. 
how a legal memo okay. is written. Okay. Thank you. Okay, let, let me let me take three uh, these three questions uh, as others organize their thoughts uh, to ask their their questions. Right. Okay, so the the question about Article thirty three five. So Article thirty three five essentially uh, says that the right the rights guaranteed by Articles twelve all the way to thirty two in the Constitution. Those rights do not exclude other fundamental human rights that are necessary and inherent in a democracy. Right. So, by way of interpretation, uh, uh, Article 33 5 could be used as a window to bring in others that have not been included in chapter five. Democracy, you uh, giving according equal respect and dignity to both same-sex uh, same persons and uh, opposite-sex persons is considered to be inherent in a democracy, then you could smuggle that into our constitution under Article, article uh, 33.5. Now, the difficulty with that Article 33.5 is that uh, so far, our Supreme Court has not interested, uh, interpreted what is meant by inherent in a democracy. Remember that there are different forms of democracy, right? So what one judge may consider to be inherent in a democracy may not be considered by another judge to be inherent in a democracy. But technically speaking, that window provided by Article 33.5 could be used to import other fundamental human rights into uh, the human rights corpus uh, of our constitution. Now, in respect of the LGBT argument and then Article 14, which talks about personal liberty. Yes, you are right. When you look at Article 14, especially the, the, the circumstances outline under Article 14 for, depriva uh, for deprivation of personal liberty. You get a sense that personal liberty here is being used in a restricted sense of movement. But remember that I also have the right to uh, movement also guaranteed somewhere uh, in chapter five of the constitution, right? Now, personal liberty is not just about movement. I mean, generally speaking, as a concept, personal liberty goes beyond beyond uh, physical movements or physical restrictions. So by way of argument, it is possible for somebody to argue uh, that if I have the right to personal liberty, that personal liberty includes a liberty for me to define what is good for me as a human being, what I think I should aspire to, who I think I should associate with and all. So I can link that right to personal liberty to the issue of the, the LGBT, right? Now that, the third question is about uh, legal memos, basically uh, legal briefs, right? Usually uh, in a law firm, when you are tasked to write a legal brief, you are always given an issue to research and then give uh, a, a kind of opinion as to what the proper legal outcome, outcome uh, should be. Now, you could use the same structure that you use when you are answering problem questions, when you are doing a legal memo. Uh, start with the issue. In fact, your first paragraph should clearly state the issue that you've been asked to research upon. Whether or not LGBT uh, rights uh, are organized in the 92 Constitution of Ghana. Then you then come to the applicable law. You do constitutional, statutory, uh, case law, if, if any, then you come to now applying applying the law to the issue that you have, and then you draw a conclusion. And if you've been asked to give advice, then you go you go ahead to give ad advice uh, flowing from the outcome of your of your legal anal analysis. Uh, so, if you are doing a legal memo, you could you could adapt. Uh, you could adapt the the format for answering problem questions, and, and you sh and you should be good. Yes, please. Um, good evening, Doc. 
Yes. Um, please, uh, I didn't hear Doc um, throwing uh, more light on the um, um, advantages, the disadvantages of um, LGBT. So if he could do that, I would be very happy. Thank you. We are Phyllis. Doc, I, I think my question is closely related uh, my, to my, uh, my, my, my question or comment relates to what the lady has just said. It was when Dr. Bassett, whom I know to uh, uh, started, he said he, he was going to, I may speak to LBT in respect of uh, arguments that have been advanced for, then he comes to against. But he has done for. He has not done against. So that I was thinking that if we could allow him time to exhaust those areas, then we can make a very meaningful contribution or uh, comment or uh, can ask relevant questions in respect of that. I'm so grateful. Okay. Um, and as I miss, I miss the earlier comment. Uh, so if uh, that comment could be repeated, yes. I think there was a lady before, uh, before this comment. So if I, if you could um, um, just paraphrase what, what the, the, uh, the earlier uh, speaker said, so that I take it together with, with this last comment, yes. Uh, hello, Ernest. Uh, uh, yes, I, I can hear you now. Yes. So, to say that uh, the compliments, you want to say that the idea. Okay. So, so the arguments against LGBT. Uh, hello, Ernest. Uh, you mean arguments against LGBT, right? Hello, Doc. Good evening. Uh, yeah, yeah, good evening. Good evening. Yeah. Uh, my question is um, you mentioned a uh, commission of inquiry, your article. This was the title of the article. Um, and, and, as, and as if you can share it with them, I think it's commissions of inquiry as tools for something. I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't immediately recall. I've written about two or three articles on commissions of inquiry. But I think I forwarded, um, I forwarded it to an uh, estimate of uh, Dr. Uh, Osudapa. I'm sure he will, he, will, he will share it with you after, after this section. Okay, so let me um, let, let me attempt to uh, to answer the earlier uh, to respond to the earlier comment. Um, yeah, so I, I in a very uh, not very detailed manner uh, uh, spoke about some of the arguments for LGBT. What are some of the arguments against LGBT, particularly in the context of that? Right now, one argument that we could make uh, is that is the one that I made about about uh, separation of powers, right? That the job of, of the judiciary is to interpret the law. Their job is not to be imposing their will on us. And issues of LGBT, uh, LGBT uh, involve serious issues of social policy. The moment you allow same self sexual relationship, the next thing that you need to start thinking about is allowing same-self marriage. The next thing that you have to start thinking about is allowing same-self couple to uh, adopt. The next thing that you have to think about is whether or not you allow people who have religious ob objections, you know, to providing services to same-self couple uh, to be able to uphold those religious objections. So there are quite a number of issues you know, that open up the moment you allow just the first step. And because of the nature of this issue, it is better you have the legislature that has the window uh, and the space to fashion 
issues of social policy to determine whether or not it will allow it and to what extent it will allow it. It is not for uh, the judiciary through activism to say that uh, it's, it's, it's now accepted in many parts of the world and because of that we must also accept it because it's inherent in our constitution. So that's one argument. The other argument could also be about what do majority of Ghanaians think? You know, because in constitutional interpretation, issues of tradition are also very important. Uh, at the time that the, the two constitution uh, was promulgated, we had we still had uh, section 101 uh, and others of, of the Criminal Offenses Act on, uh, on natural uh, canal knowledge. And there was no discussion whatsoever during And there was no discussion about the unconstitutionality of section uh, 101, you know, of the criminal of, of Act 29. When, when uh, at the Constitutive Assembly, people were arguing about the, uh, the draft constitutional provisions. So because of that, this whole argument that it is unconstitutional and oh, it's a bit historical, it's a bit ahistorical. By the time that it was, the constitution was promulgated, there was no issue about, if, uh, about LGBT. And for you to say that the constitution now prohibits LGBT uh, to, to, to basically to be interpreting the constitution in the wrong way. So we could use issues of separation of power that it is better for the legislature uh, that has the, man, the direct mandate of the people to determine whether it will allow it or not. We could also uh, use issues of tradition that our tradition is that, I mean, we don't, we don't permit these things and the tradition is an expression of our cultural identity and all that. And there's nothing about this uh, cultural expression which is against any fundamental human rights and that the constitution guarantees our culture and the culture that makes us, us Ghanaians and so on and so forth. So because of that, if we want to prohibit it, we are within our rights to prohibit. So, so these are some of the arguments I think uh, could be put forward against the issue of uh, uh, LGBT. Uh, and next. And how are you doing? Uh, hello, uh, Ernest. Uh, hello. Okay, I think uh, Ed Agnes is trying to uh, join the section. 
but we have hit our upper limit. So if uh, a few students uh, could could uh, log out to enable Ernest uh, to join so that he can moderate the, the discussion. Uh, we've hit the 300 uh, mark. So Ernest is unable to join to moderate the discussion. But let me, I saw uh, some questions on the, uh, the, the chat, the chat section. Uh, Okay, I'm, I'm back. Uh, uh, to the view that then to, you need to link them uh, to any of the fundamental human rights in chapter five. So that was the first view, that in themselves, they are not justiciable. In order for them to be justiciable, they have to take them in conjunction with the fundamental human rights uh, in chapter five of the constitution. But later, the Supreme Court took you know, revive or revise this view, uh, revise this view in the lotteries uh, uh, case, uh, essentially by saying that no, they are presumptively justiciable. In, in other words, you start with a presumption that they are justiciable. It is only if you realize that the language in which they have been expressed is such that you cannot enforce them, that's why you don't enforce them. But because they are constitutional provisions, like all other constitutional provisions, they should be enforceable. So you start with a presumption of justiciability, uh, but then that presumption uh, can be rebutted. But apart from that, there is a general argument why the actual principle of state policy tend not to be justiciable. Now, the main argument is that, look, when you look at chapter six, chapter six is expressed in such broad aspirational language. That is why uh, chapter uh, article um, 36 basically says that the actual principle of state uh, policy shall guide the legislature, the executive, the judiciary, and all other organs or agencies in applying the provision of the constitution. So it's more aspirational. It tends, the other principles of state policy tend to be expressed in such vague, vague and general. When you have vague and general language, it is judicially difficult to enforce that. It is judicially difficult to enforce very vague and, uh, and general language because you find it very, very difficult to, uh, to get to the core of, of that provision, the provision of the, of, of the, of the the principle of state policy. So this, this is the general argument in constitutional law why the IT principle of state policy uh, are considered not, not justiciable. What I said in the in the lotteries case, the Supreme Court took the view that they are presumptively justiciable, which means that you start with a presumption that they are enforceable, except if that by the by the language that you are dealing with, it's not possible for you to uh, enforce uh, any principle in chapter six of the constitution. Uh, any any other questions? Uh, uh, Fatima, I've made you a co-host uh, because my internet at my end is no good. So allow my co-host to speak now, uh, Fatima. Okay, good. My co-host, you can speak. Um, Doc, thank you. Um, Doc, with the greatest respect, my apologies for this infantile question, but I just want some clarity. There seems to be some uh, lack of coherence on it for my part. As it relates to the commission of inquiry and the adverse findings, if any, that is adduced from it. I understand that obviously, as of right, it is an appellate institution with the high court that can deal with any adverse findings for those who are found culpable. But I wanted to know the AG, can the AG, can the AG independent of the adverse fact finding within the context of the Commission of Inquiry, institute or proffer charges against somebody who has had adverse findings against them, independent of the findings of the Commission of Inquiry, or it can be dependent on the findings of the Commission of Inquiry. Most grateful. Okay. Thank you. So let me so let me let me take this question before others come in. 
Yes. So, uh, so when you look at the structure of commissions of inquiry and uh, under the constitution, right? So the adverse findings of a commission of inquiry, depending on certain conditions, will constitute what a judgment of the high court. Will constitute a judgment of a high court that are appealable to the court of appeal. That are appealable to the court of appeal. So judgment of the high court and appealable to the court of appeal. Now, there, there is a historical reason why we have that constitutional provision. In some of, um, uh, under the, the 1979, uh, 69 constitution, for example, we didn't have the judge, uh, the adverse finds of the commission of inquiry uh, being a judgment of the high court. So by reason of that, when adverse findings are made against you, uh, you have no records. You cannot appeal the adverse findings. Perhaps the only thing that you could do is apply for uh, for judicial for judicial review. So under the 1979 and the 92 Constitution, it was felt that look, adverse findings have been made against you. It is possible that the commission made mistakes. Why don't you have the right to appeal to the Court of Appeal so that the matter uh, could be taken a fresh look could be taken at the matter, and 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 if you succeed in having those adverse findings set aside, uh, so uh, so be it. Now, to answer your question uh, directly, can the Attorney General proffer criminal charges on the basis of the adverse findings, or can he proffer criminal charges outside of the adverse findings? Now, the, the, the issue that you are raising is the issue that came up in the MPNE case, Republic uh, and Kwame uh, and Kwame and Reku uh, so, and, and in that case, it's a high court decision. Uh, the high court uh, per Mafosau, uh, then an additional kind of a took the view that by his understanding of the relevant constitutional provisions, you could not, the AG could not proffer criminal charges on the basis of the work of the commissions of inquiry, that you could not do that. Because the aim of the provisions on uh, commissions of inquiry is to ensure that no, we don't turn that process into a criminal process. So by reason of that, those adverse findings cannot form the basis of any criminal charge against any accused person. So on the basis of that, uh, Mafosa or blessed uh, memory uh, acquitted uh, and discharged uh, Reku Brobe uh, and Uh But many legal scholars, including myself, think that that decision is, is not correct. Uh, it's not correct. When you look at it in light of uh, the history and the legal evolution of commissions of inquiry, it is absolutely not correct. And in fact, even before that decision, there have been a number of uh, prosecutions that have been mounted on the basis of the adverse findings of commissions of inquiry. You remember the Diana uh, murder trial, for example. Uh, those who were, who were prosecuted, they were prosecuted on the basis of adverse findings or findings made by the then commission of, of inquiry. So, so there's a decision that says that you cannot do that, but that is only a high court decision. And that decision will not be even be binding on another on, on, on the high court differently constituted. But uh, I, I think there are, there are very good legal arguments uh, to the effect that no, that decision is not correct and needs to be uh, revisited. And I think I have, uh, in an article that I did, I have addressed this issue. I don't know whether the article I, I forwarded to NS to share with you, but I have an article that specifically uh, addresses, um, uh, Mr. it does a case review uh, of Republic uh, uh, and Kwame and, and, and basically says that no, the judge's um, interpretation of, of the constitution is, is not correct. Uh, and there's any any other questions? Hello, Prof. Yeah, yeah hello. Lisa, I there was a, a discussion yesterday, and uh, uh, that has to do with uh, the present issue regarding the BMPC and the audits. Auditor General over uh, the, I think, section uh, Article 7, uh, 11, 7, 
Ask her uh, one eight, uh, one eight, seven, seven. Eleven, seven. Eleven, seven, okay. Yes, uh, that's the case between, uh, uh, I think, uh, the Association of Finance Houses and the okay. uh, Bank, uh, Bank of Ghana. Bank of Ghana, okay. okay. The ruling, All right. I, I, want to, I want to be apprised with the ruling because I, I'm trying to find the case. I, I haven't been able to lay my hands on one. The dicta of the court, because per the, per the provision of the constitution, it says uh, if any uh, bill is to come, it's to come to, to be laid before parliament and gazette, the date is gazette, uh, the day it is laid, it should be gazetted and to spend 21 days. But per the ruling, the ruling is far different from what the provision of the constitution has provided. Uh, so I want to be apprised by for the dicta of the, of the ruling. Okay. All right, okay, so uh, thanks for the question. So then, so this case um, essentially relates to Article uh, 11.7. So Article 11.7 basically says that, you know, if, if uh, power has been given to somebody to make rules uh, or regulations or orders, then those rules, regulations and orders have to be placed uh, before parliament for 21 certain days. Uh, and then it also has to be gazetted on the date it's made before parliament and after 21 certain days, if it has not been annulled by parliament by teacher's majority, then it will have the force of law. So now, now this article uh, 11, seven has, uh, has, has been the subject of interpretation in a number of cases, right? Now, uh, before the, under the 1979 constitution, we had Esparti Bombali, and I'm sure most of you are aware of this case. So Esparti Bombali had to do with the deportation of an Italian. And then the argument there was whether or not that deportation order, which was done by way of an executive instrument, to have been laid before parliament for 21 certain days for it to be uh, valid and effective before the deportation could be carried out. And in a very seminal decision by Cecilia Corantin Ardo of Desert Men, she said that no, uh, even though uh, article, the equivalent of Article uh, 11 7 under the 1979 Constitution talks about orders, rules, and regulations. It is not every order, rule, and regulation that might be placed before Parliament for 21 certain days. And there she laid a test for orders, rules, and regulations that might be placed before Parliament. In other words, you know, some orders should be placed before Parliament, others need not be placed before Parliament for 21 certain days. And what she said, the test was that if the rule is more like administrative in character, it's like you are implementing the law, or it's a kind of like a command, a command, there's nothing legislative about a command, it's purely administrative, it's about you exercising or implementing power, uh, 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 exercising power, uh, implementing authority by reason of that, it is it will not be affected by the equivalent of Article 11 7 of the Constitution. So, so that has been the position of the law. So, for example, EIs are not required to be placed uh, before Parliament for 21 days. Uh, and there was this case also of Okanin, uh, O-K-A-N-E in Attorney General. This was a case when the, the president had um, uh, constituted some district assemblies uh, or so. The argument was that it should be placed before uh, parliament for 21 days. And the Supreme Court said, no, no, no it's purely executive in character. It's purely administrative. Uh, it's basically implementing the law. And because it's executive in character, it need not be placed in parliament for 21 certain days. So, so the legal position is that under Article uh, uh, 11, 7, uh, only, only rules, orders, and regulations that are legislative in character must be placed before parliament. If they are not legislative in, in character, like EIs, then you need not place uh, them before parliament. So let me give you an example. So when our EC is coming out with uh, rules for our elections, no, those rules are legislative in character because they will tell you what you need to do, uh, if for nominations, you need to do this, you need to do that. That is why every time the EC will place those regulations before parliament. So in uh, CI 127, just place before parliament, right? But when the EC is issuing a constitutional instrument under Article 64 to say that, oh, this person has been elected as president of the Republic of Ghana, that instrument 
it's not placed before parliament because that instrument is essential implementing a certain a certain ask a certain law that talks about how a president should be should be elected and announced to to, to Ghanaians, right? So even though both come under CI, both uh, CI 127, about the one about nomination and all and all that is a CI, and the one about who has been elected president is also a CI. One is placed before parliament, the other is not placed uh, before parliament because it is executive or basically just implementing uh, the law. Now, this case that you are talking about is a recent case. It's a recent case involving the Bank of Ghana. The Bank of Ghana had come out with uh, certain rules uh, that should govern how banks conduct certain affairs. And then the argument there was, that, and, and the Bank of Ghana never placed those rules before. Uh, before parliament, right? So the plaintiff went to court basically say that, no, no, these rules are legislative in character. And by reason of that, it should have been placed before parliament for 21 sitting days. And because that didn't happen, the rules are unconstitutional, invalid, un invalid and unconstitutional. But the Supreme Court took a different uh, view uh, and, and tell you, sorry, had done an analysis of the decision, a case for the decision indicating why he thinks that decision is, is erroneous uh, and all that. So to answer your question directly, the, the law, as far as we, uh, we, uh, we know it, is that under Article uh, 11, 7, it is only uh, a rule, a regulation or other that is legislative in character that must be placed before, before parliament. If it is not legislative in character, no matter how you, you, you characterize it, it need not be placed uh, in parliament for 21 days as a matter, a matter of law. As to whether or not the Supreme Court decision is um, uh, it was rightly decided, uh, I think you should go ahead and read a decision and also um, tell your stories, criticism or critique uh, of that decision. And as if you remind me tomorrow, I, I can forward a copy of the decision to you so I, you can share it with, uh, with that there. Uh, any any other questions? Hello, good evening. Yeah, good evening. Uh, Dr. Bassett, my question is in regards to Article 1466. 1466, okay. All right, my issue here, here is uh, if you read the case of A.J. Chum versus Attorney General, it tells yeah. you how unconstitutional it is if a prima facie case is not established before the removal of the Chief Justice. By reading Article 1466, it is very silent on uh, the issue of a prima facie case. And I wanted to find out, is there the need for a prima facie to be established before a chief justice is removed? And in this case, who then establish the prima facie case? Because all it says is that the committee appointed under clause six of this article shall inquire into the petition and recommend to the president whether the chief justice ought to be removed from office. That is all that he says. So I want to know, is there the need for this uh, establishment of a prima facie and by whom? Okay, so uh, thanks for the question. So the Supreme Court has already and conclusively uh, determined this matter uh, in the in the Chum case, right? The Judge Chum case. Uh, the Supreme Court admitted that indeed there appears to be a lacuna. The lacuna uh, uh, lies in the fact that for other Supreme Court judges or Superior Court uh, 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 judges, there is a need for a prima facie case to be determined uh, by by the chief judges. For other persons who are affected by Article One Four Six, there is a need for a prima facie case. So why is it that for the chief justice, you know, for you know, there isn't an express need for a prima facie case? So because of that, by way of interpretation, uh, the Supreme Court took the view that yes, the chief justice must also benefit from the uh, this point of a prima facie uh, case uh, before 
the committee could go into the matter. Now, this is a very interesting matter because um, we got um, some time ago, uh, Dr. SKB Asante, who is basically essentially the architect of the 92 constitution came to give a lecture at the School of Law University of Ghana uh, and basically took the view that what the Supreme Court did was right because there was clearly an error that was made. Now, the original proposal was that in the case of the Chief Justice, right, the Council of States should make that prima facie determination. However, when the matter went for deliberation at the Consultative Assembly, it appears that provision was removed. So when that provision was removed, it brought about a certain lack of equivalence in terms of how the Chief Justice is treated and how other Supreme Court judges are treated. You know, so what the Supreme Court basically did was to bring back you know, what was the original intent behind those provisions. And, and I think that it makes perfect sense you know, then the chief, in the case of the chief judge, there should also be a prima facie case. Okay. So, so the current legal understanding is that that prima facie case has to be made by the council uh, of state. Uh, and if you've been following the news, uh, there's been a recent petition for the removal of the chief justice. And just yesterday, it was reported that uh, the council of state had presented its report uh, to, the, mm -hmm. to the president. You know, so the practice now, uh, person one to the decision in the J. Chum case is that in the case of the chief justice, uh, the matter goes to the president, the petition goes to the president, and the president refers it to the council of state for the council of state to make a prima facie determination or not. If there is a prima facie determination before uh, a committee will be will be set up to go into into the matter. So, so despite the silence of Article uh, One Four Six Six on a prima facie case respect of the chief justice. The current understanding as a result of the Jechum case uh, is, is, is that um, the chief justice is also entitled to the benefit of a prima, of a prima facie case. Uh, okay. Mamitiwa, uh, Mamitiwa, I have something to say. Tell Yeah, tell um, Doc. Um, Doc, can you please throw more light on Article 75 and 181? Thank 181. You. Uh, 75, so, okay, 181 relates to uh, loans and international business uh, or economic, economic transactions. Um, now, the key thing about Article 181 is that no, if the government of Ghana is going to take a loan, or the government of Ghana is going to give a loan to any person, that loan, that loan agreement needs the prior approval of, of parliament. So that one appears to be quite straightforward. Now, the complication comes with Article 1815, which tends to apply the provisions of Article 181 all the way to 1814 uh, to international business or economic transactions. And in a number of cases, uh, starting from uh, Faro uh, Atlantic, Atlantic, the Supreme Court has indicated that if you are a foreign entity and then you enter into an uh, international transaction with the government of Ghana, then that agreement requires prior parliamentary approval to be valid. So Faro Atlantic started with government of Ghana as a counterparty, a foreign entity as a counterparty. That agreement, because it is a foreign entity with the government of Ghana, that agreement needs to go to parliament for parliamentary approval in order to be valid. Now, subsequent cases have changed this position or have uh, further advanced, you know, or given uh, other aspects, provided other aspects to this position. So in Barkan, in Barkan, the issue was, what about if you don't have a foreign entity uh, contracting with the government of Ghana, but that entity is already also registered in Ghana. So it's a Ghanaian entity against the government of Ghana. The Supreme Court went ahead to say that, yes, it could still be governed by Article 1815 if you could establish, based upon the analysis of the contract, that that contract is international in nature, right? It's international in nature if you look at a number of issues. Uh, who are the shareholders? Are they foreign shareholders? Is, is there an uh, arbitra international arbitration clause? The nature of the transaction? Whether it is a major transaction involving the resources of the country? So a number of tests uh, 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 was uh, outlined in Balkan, 
as a way of determining whether international business or economic transaction, even involving a company that has been registered in Ghana, but with certain international character, will still make that transaction, international business or economic transaction under Article 1815. Then later we had a series of cases, uh, the Waterview case, the Isofoton case, uh, and so on and so forth. What this case established is that if it is an international business or economic transaction and you don't have prior parliamentary approval, that contract is null and void and you'll not be allowed to recover anything under the contract. So the current position is that if uh, it's an international business or economic transaction involving the government of Ghana, but then it wasn't laid before parliament or parliamentary approval, that contract is void. And the government of Ghana will not be obliged to perform any obligations under the contract. Uh, it will be unfortunate for you if already you have expended money under the contract, because the government of Ghana will not be permitted by the Supreme Court to enforce any, any aspect of the contract or, or kind of um, perform any obligations under the contract by reason of the fact that that contract wasn't approved by, uh, by parliament. So this is the current state of the law. But let me add that, uh, there have been a number of uh, international arbitrations involving Ghana, and arbitral tribunals have consistently ignored Article 1815. Uh, so those of us who have been involved in international arbitration, you don't even want to even make that argument because the arbitral tribunals will not accept it because they see it to be absolutely unfair. I come, in, I come to your country, you enter into a contract with me, you have the obligation to place it before parliament, you don't do so, and then I perform my obligation under the contract, then later you breach your, your, the agreement, and then when I seek to enforce it, you say, oh, the thing should have gone to parliament for approval. So consistently, the National Arbitral Tribunals have disregarded Article 1815 as interpreted by, by our Supreme Court. But in Ghana, the position of the law is that if international business or economic transaction is not approved by parliament, then the government of that agreement is, is void, is not operational. The government of Ghana is not obliged to perform any obligations under the agreement. Uh, Article 75, uh, uh, remind you, what does Article 75 talk about? Is it about uh, international relations? I don't have my constitution here, unfortunately. It talks about execution of treaties. Okay, very good. Yeah, so Article 35, uh, 75 talks about execution of treaties, and they are essentially, under our law, there are essentially uh, two ways for a treaty that has been executed to, to be incorporated into our laws, right? So remember that, uh, as you all, um, um, uh, remember that Ghana is a dualist, is a dualist nation. As a dualist nation, when our governments enter or sign treaties, those treaties do not have automatic applicability and enforcement within our domestic jurisdiction. In order for any treaty signed by our government to be, become part of our laws and as such enforceable, two, one or two things have to happen. Either that treaty is now domesticated to a bill passed by parliament, right? Or that parliament passes a resolution ratifying the treaty. When parliament passes a resolution ratifying the treaty, then that treaty then will become part of our law. So Article 75 basically tells you of the, these two main ways uh, by which uh, a treaty that has been ratif uh, ratified or acceded to by, by our government, in this case, the president, uh, could become part of our law. So either through a ratif uh, through a domestication, and you do it through by laying a bill before parliament and passing through all the parliamentary processes, or, or parliament uh, will just pass a resolution. Uh, and then once it is ratified, it becomes part of our laws. To say because uh, Dr. Bassetam is uh, running out. Yes, Ellen. So yeah. I'll, I'll take I'll take the last set of questions. Yeah. Attention. Let's allow another person. Yeah. 
Yes, Dr. Good evening. Lisa, yeah. I, I... Yes, Doc. Please, uh, what's your take on the, the what's your take on the concept of citizenship and allegiance? Are the two the same? And uh, what what does our constitution say in about them? The last, uh, the last yeah. Okay, so yeah, if I may, okay, so if I may, if I may take the question on citizenship and allegiance, um, yeah, so our constitution uh, clearly uses uh, two different terms, right? It talks about citizenship and it talks about, um, it talks about allegiance. Um, uh, now, we do not have any, any conclusive interpretation by our Supreme Court and whether or not owing allegiance to a country is the same as being a citizen of that country. But generally speaking, but generally speaking, uh, citizenship could be different from owing allegiance. In other words, owing allegiance would be the broad set, right? And then citizenship uh, could, could be a subset of that broad set. So when you are a citizen of a country, you owe allegiance to the country. But the fact that you owe allegiance to a country does not necessarily mean that you are a citizen of that country. So let me give you an example. In, during the colonial era, right, uh, in Ghana, we had, uh, we had um, uh, British protected persons, we had British subjects and all. Uh, but you, we, we also had persons who were not British protected persons or subject in the sense that they didn't come from uh, maybe a common law country. They only found themselves uh, maybe within Ghana because they were born in Ghana. But by reason of they having been born in Ghana, they owed allegiance. They were expected to obey the laws and not to betray the secrets of the state. So, so even though in terms of status, they are not British subjects or British protected persons. It is still a requirement that they, they have certain duties towards the state in terms of owing allegiance uh, to the state because the state that protects them, gives them certain legal protections and so on and so forth. So to answer your question directly, um, owing allegiance is a broader category and citizenship could be part of it. But the fact that you, uh, you, you owe allegiance to a country doesn't necessarily mean that you must be a citizen, a citizen of, of, of that country. So the, the two uh, 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 could be mutually uh, exclusive, but there could also be some relationship between them. But nothing prevents our Supreme Court from saying that in the context of our constitution, owing allegiance to a country and Ghana means you not be a citizen of Ghana, you mean, meaning that uh, your citizenship, you're a citizen of, of some other country. I hope I have answered your question. Yes, Doug, good evening. Uh, good evening. Yeah, please, my, my question is um, uh, under Article 11. Uh, under Article 11, um, we have um, the source of the law, that is the, our primary laws, where an order, rule, or regulation can be um, a law, a source of law, but it must be laid before Parliament. But here is a case that um, executive instrument is not part of this one. So is it a law properly so called, and what is its effect? What is the legal effect of the EI? Um, I think I, I had explained explained that. Yes, so as I said, the active instrument is, is also law, right? Uh, so there are various kinds of, of laws. Uh, just that under Article 11.7, um, uh, the others rules and regulations that might be placed before Parliament are those others rules and regulations that are legislative in character. Uh, and often executive instruments are not executive, in, uh, are not legislative in character because they seek to implement law powers that, are, that uh, have already been uh, been given. The Supreme Court has explained this in a number of cases, the Orkani case, the Orkani and Attorney General, 
uh, and then in the in the eighties, we also had the Bombali case, where Sir Quentin Abel makes a distinction between uh, others' rules and regulations of a legislative character and those of an executive character, and basically saying that uh, and the and the equivalent of Article uh, Eleven Seven under the nineteen seventy nine Constitution, it is only. Uh, rules, regulations that are legislative in character that might be placed before parliament, but if they are executive in character, then that requirement of 21 days is inapplicable. Okay, and next, uh, maybe this will be my, my last comment. Um, I think Dr. Enes' line dropped. Okay, so thank you. Thank you so much. Um, uh, thank you so, so, so much. It's been um, uh, a very good uh, inter interactive uh, uh, section. Uh, but if you have any, any questions, uh, don't, you could forward those questions to Enes, and I wouldn't mind doing a voice note to answer any other specific questions that you may, may have. On that note, uh, thank you so much for your attention uh, and, and for all the very good questions uh, that you asked. It's been, it's been my great pleasure uh, being with you. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir.